We've got people from all over. Hi, everyone. Good morning to the Darien Library. We have a terrific program for you this morning with John Dunn, the author of The Glitter in Green in Search of Hummingbirds. We'd like to thank the Darien Nature Center for partnering with us today, as well as Barrett Books, who I'm sure have plenty of books for after this program for you to stop by and pick one up. We'd also like to thank the Friends of the Library, who are always on our side and make these programs possible. A little housekeeping, type your questions in the Q&A field and we will address them at the end. Uh, now let me tell you a little bit about John so we can get to the really great part of the program. John is an acclaimed natural history writer, a photographer and a wildlife tour leader. His writing has appeared in a number of magazines, including BBC Wildlife, he also recently received terrific reviews for this book from the Wall Street Journal and the Kirkus Review. He's been on NPR. He is the author of three previous books, including Orchid Summer. John lives on the remote Shetland Islands in Great Britain. The Glitter in Green tells the story of the hummingbird as never before. Their history, their compelling life cycles, and the stories of those who have fallen under their spell. It is the ultimate celebration of the world's most charismatic bird. This book also is a call to action. Today, hummingbirds exist on a knife edge, fighting for survival. Let's join John for the full tale of this wonderful book. And right now I'll turn you over and John will share his screen with you. So enjoy everyone and we'll take questions later. Hello, Th thank you Kathleen for that warm and generous welcome. Um, as Kathleen says, um, my name's John. I'm speaking to you from the Shetland Islands. Um, so if anyone's uh, not familiar with where that is, um, if you can imagine a map of Great Britain, uh, we're halfway between the top of Scotland and Norway. So hopefully the internet will stay with us. There's a raging storm blowing outside the window at the moment. You may hear the sound of rain lashing. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a wonderful place, but it is a little temperamental. So, um, the glitter in the green. Um, why hummingbirds? Now, that's an obvious question. I get asked this all the time. Um, it's, uh, I, I, I'm showing you this, it's clearly not a hummingbird, um, but it explains a lot. Um, I call it Exhibit A. This is what passes for a warbler where I'm from. Now, you guys, um, you have colourful warblers, warblers which look like sweets in a, an old-fashioned um, candy store. But this is, this is what passes for a warbler here. It's a chiff-chaff. And you need to put yourselves in my shoes as a boy growing up in the south of England. Um, the birds weren't very exciting, if I'm honest. Um, I'm, a, I'm a birder, I, I, I love birds, but I'm also, uh, uh, I'm drawn to colour like a, a, a moth to flame. Um, I'm a bit like a bower bird. I, I like the bright and shiny things. And as a child, I was obsessed with colour um, and the natural world in equal measure. And so the birds, didn't completely capture me from day one. What did were butterflies and wildflowers, particularly orchids. And the birds, warblers like this, not so much. And then um, my mum took me up to, to London for a day trip one day. And bless her, my mum's wonderful. She, she took me there to see all of the usual things which people go to London to see as a tourist. Um, things like the black cabs, the, the, the red London buses, um, the changing of the guard, all of the usual things. But what I wanted to go to was the London Natural History Museum. And when I got there, um, I saw birds in a new light. And what changed it for me was one particular exhibit in the museum. And that was, and this is quite bleak, um, a display of taxidermied hummingbirds. Now, this is a photo I, I, I took on my phone and it, it doesn't do it justice. Um, these were birds which were collected 
gosh, where are we now? These would have been about 150 years ago, and they were assembled into one grand um, taxidermied case. They were collected from um, all over the Americas, but predominantly South America. So put yourselves into my 10-year-old shoes. I was taken to the London Natural History Museum after quite a reluctant day out in London. And I walked up to this cabinet and a shaft of sunlight um, came into the, the corridor it was housed in. And these dusty, dry husks of birds blazed with color. And anyone who's seen a hummingbird will kind of know what I'm talking about here. Their, their, their plumage is iridescent. And when the light strikes it in just the right way, it blazes. And it, 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 it absolutely riveted me to the spot at the time. I'd never seen birds like this before. Um, not only the color, but also the, the shape and form of these birds. Um, they, they, some of them had preposterously long bills, amazingly long tails. Um, they, they were birds in color, shape and form like I had never seen before. And a seed was sown at that point. And I'm quite an obsessive character. I do love to, to read into things which interest me. And as a young boy, I wasn't so big into fiction. I love books with facts in. And so the more I, I, the more I became obsessed with hummingbirds, the more I wanted to know about them. Now, a friend of mine, Tim D, he's a fabulous writer, and he describes hummingbirds as, as strange birds, not quite birds or somehow more than birds, birds 2.0 perhaps. And the more I looked into hummingbirds as a young kid growing up in, in Britain in the 1980s, um, there was no internet. So I went to the library, of course, because that's where you go to, to find out really cool stuff. And I, I discovered that hummingbirds were, were birds which, which had a host of superlatives attached to them. And a lot of those superlatives attached to their, um, the, the sort of defining thing about a hummingbird, they hover, we all know that. But how they do it is fabulous. Um, their flight muscles um, account for a, a third of their body mass, 30%. And that's twice the muscle mass of most other birds. Um, their muscles are driven by a heart which beats at over a thousand times per minute, um, which lets them, allows them to, to, to flap those, those, those narrow sickle-shaped wings um, in excess of 50 times per second. And yet at night, they can slow those hearts down to below 100 beats per minute and enter a state of torpor to allow their high metabolisms to slow right down to conserve energy till the morning. And this is, I, I love this, their body temperature drops to just a couple of degrees above the ambient air temperature around them. Now in the high Andes, that can be just above freezing point, um, which I've heard described as a state of controlled hypothermia. Now, all of this stuff I found utterly compelling. Um, I'd look out of the window and see the house sparrows and the starlings, which I know we've exported to you guys, but you know, those sorts of birds, and they were just so dull compared to these vital, amazing birds, which of course existed somewhere utterly removed from where I was in, in, in Britain. Hummingbirds are only found in the Americas. And the more I read, the, the more I discovered they have a rich cultural history, which stretches from antiquity. Um, the native peoples of the Americas, wherever they're found, from the far north to the, the very far south, have uh, rich um, histories of hummingbirds appearing time and time again in their folklore and their beliefs. Um, some of those representations are easily understood. They're portrayed as messengers of gods um, as a bridge between the, the, the world of the living and the dead. And the Aztecs, for example, um, thought that fallen warriors came back as hummingbirds. Um, other representations, um, as you can see in the, the top of the screen there, the, the, the famous 
Nazca lines in the um, desert of, of uh, the Nazca desert of Peru. Amongst them, one of the most famous um, representations is a vast hummingbird uh, carved into the desert floor. It's hundreds of years old, and no one really knows what those lines were were, were all about. Um, famously, in the 1970s, Eric von Daniken, in his book *The Messengers of the Gods*, described them as um, as some sort of interface between aliens and the human world. That's a little fanciful, but Nevertheless, why a hummingbird? Why a vast hummingbird there in the middle of the desert? Um, and then, of course, um, the uh, native peoples had been managing just fine for, for centuries, for millennia. Um, Europeans turned up, and in particular, the Spanish, uh, the conquistadors came to, to uh, Mexico um, initially, and there they found the Aztecs not only were revering um, hummingbirds as, as fallen warriors, but they, they also were using their feathers um, in, um, well, they had feather craftsmen called amantecas who would create um, beautiful um, works of, of, um, of, uh, of, of art and also shield coverings and all from bird feathers and including, of course, the iridescent feathers of hummingbirds. Uh, the Spanish, course were, were Catholics and they turned the Amantecas as they subsumed the Aztec Empire, they turned those feather craftsmen to create Christian iconography. Um, for example, this portrait of Christ and, and also the, the, the tiny little um, amulet you, you see there as well on the screen. Um, and they were, they were using the, the, the feathers to create colours which, which mere paint simply couldn't do. Now, that rich cultural history extends through to the present day. Um, they appear time and again in art, in literature, in music. Um, some of the greatest writers have been inspired by them. D. H. Lawrence, for example, described hummingbirds as a bit of life chipped off in brilliance. But they also appear in works by the likes of Charles Dickens, Pablo Neruda, T. S. Eliot, Virginia Woolf, and in contemporary works too. Um, for example, at the moment, uh, Jeff Vandermeer's vivid novel, Hummingbird Salamander, which was published at the same time as, um, as um, The Glitter in the Green, um, being a, a good contemporary example where hummingbirds have um, a, a, a cultural resonance to this day. Um, the picture here of, uh, of self-portrait with Thor necklace and hummingbird by Frida Kahlo is, is interesting because it touches on something else which uh, to this present day hummingbirds also um, do. At her neck you'll see a small dark um, hummingbird hanging from the, the necklace of thorns. Um, this is a chuparosa, which is a, a, a Mexican love token um, something which is believed to bring the, the wearer um, the, the, the love of the person that they desire. Uh, and this is still something which is believed in some quarters to this day. And something which I was shocked to find in the researching of the book was that hummingbirds are still killed um, in Mexico to, um, to provide chuparosas for, 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 for people who, who believe in that. And so there is there are hummingbirds turning up in, in in wildlife crime, which was 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 shocking to discover. And that's just one threat which which these birds um, face. Um, anyway, hummingbirds, yes, also um, were the title of uh, of an Australian, or sorry, the, the name of an Australian um, rock band called, who were called eponymously the Hummingbirds, which I think is a great metaphor for them because these are birds which live fast and die young, which is kind of the perfect rock star um, metaphor. And they also have amazing names. And this is something which uh, Hummingbirds used in marketing a lot. And that stems from, from, from Victorian times. And one guy in particular who you see there on the, um, on the screen, this is a gentleman called John Gould. And he was, what was John Gould? 
he's known as a naturalist, but he was he was a little more than that. He was an entrepreneur and he was a businessman first and foremost. Um, he was the architect of a great many books in the um, 19th century and they covered bird families from all around the world. He did the birds of Australia, the birds of the Himalayas, and he also famously created a monograph all about the hummingbirds. He was the first person to really commercialize them. And in that monograph um, about the hummingbirds, he featured names which were unlike um, any other names for species of birds to date, and in fact, to this day. Um, he used um, mineralogy, and so there were birds which were called emeralds, sapphires, topazes. Um, some of the names described the, the, the shape of the birds and had martial um, implications like saber wings or sword bill hummingbird. There were references to mythology, there were sylphs. Um, and he was, a, he was a guy who had his eye on a commercial opportunity. At the Great Exhibition in London in 1851, he created an exhibit with some of the hummingbirds which appear in the hummingbird um, the display at the Natural History Museum, which, 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 which we began with as my inspiration. He created revolving cabinets of stuffed hummingbirds, artfully lit to, 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 to emphasize the iridescence of their feathers. And the critical thing here is that he charged sixpence per person for people to come and see this. 75,000 people, including Queen Victoria, passed through the doors specifically to see his hummingbirds. He was all about making money. And there's a quote there, he has shown himself a great enemy to the feathered tribe. Um, that was written by Elizabeth, or spoken by Elizabeth Gould, and that was his wife. He didn't enjoy a great reputation, even within his lifetime. Um, and his legacy was the darkest chapter in the historical um, history of hummingbirds. Um, it was known as murder, murderous millinery. Um, women in Victorian Britain, and indeed in Edwardian Britain in the early 20th century, um, wore feathered hats, but also um, they carried fans created from feathers. Um, they wore jewellery, brooches, earrings, necklaces, all of which featured feathers. And the famous ones are, are the feathers of egrets and ostriches. These were the vast plumes which were, were so dramatic. Um, and also, as you can see on this, this, this portrait here on the screen, um, birds of paradise. But hummingbirds, of course, were so colorful. There was no way the millinery industry or jewelry industry was going to ignore that at the time. And they were also so numerous they were slaughtered in their millions in South America in particular um, and exported to Europe. Well, not just to Europe, there were feather foundries in London and Paris, but also in New York, where these birds were created into, or, or incorporated rather, into bonnets and hats and, and as I say, jewelry and, and, and other um, accessories for the elegant women of the day. Um, the tragedy of hummingbirds was because they were so small and easily found, um, they were really cheap. And so, as a correspondent in the London Times in 1887 said, they were so cheap that even the ragged girl from the slums could decorate her battered hat like any fine lady with some bright-winged bird from the tropics. It cost pennies. Um, and they died in their millions. But and this kind of brings us through to the, the present day, they had a, a positive legacy that their death wasn't completely in vain because they inspired men and women at the time to actually care about um, birds and to see them as more as consumable items. And from the slaughter of the birds for, for hats at the time came in the UK, the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, and in the United States, the Audubon Society, both were formed from the crucible of this terrible trade for, for millinery. So 
all of this stuff, the, the literature, the, the cultural stuff, and, and the darker things too, all of this, and also, of course, the, the, the just the fabulous physical form and, and statistics of hummingbirds were a massive inspiration to me as a kid. And all I wanted to do was see a hummingbird for myself. And as a nature writer, uh, a grand plan formed. And this was that I was going to try and see some hummingbirds for myself. Now, the map here gives you a, a better representation of, of where I actually am. Um, you can see the, the Shetland Islands there, north of, of, of Scotland. And as I said, hummingbirds are only found in the Americas. Um, although, interestingly, the oldest fossils of hummingbirds actually aren't from the Americas. The, 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 the hummingbird fossils which have been found in the Americas are one to two million years old. And in uh, recent years, a um, clay pit in Germany yielded some fossils which were around about 30 million years old, which are recognizably hummingbirds. So the original hummingbirds actually evolved in Europe. And at some point, they crossed over into the Americas. And once they were there, they, they, the, and the Andes were rising, because we're talking millions of years here. They, they found themselves in, in prime habitat for, the, for, for them. And there was some huge extinction event in Europe, which left us with no hummingbirds. But I digress. The point was that for me to see hummingbirds, I had to go from Shetland to the Americas. And this is the, 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 the narrative arc of the glitter in the green. And really happily for me uh, as a writer, I live at 60 degrees north here in Shetland, and the hummingbirds which are found the furthest north in the world are found approximately at 60 degrees north in the top of Alaska. And so I started um, my journey in Cordova in Alaska in the far north, and I ended up down in Ushuaia in Tierra del Fuego in the south. Now, I went to Alaska to see rufous hummingbirds. Um, they are the, the hummingbird which has the longest known migration of any hummingbird. They fly every year 3,000 miles from their wintering grounds in Mexico and these days also Florida, all the way up to Alaska in the far north, which pound for pound um, has to, to be the, 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 the most remarkable bird migration of all. We, we all know about the likes of Arctic terns, which are migrating from the Antarctic to the Arctic every year. And, Looking over my screen, even as I speak now, the first Arctic terns are feeding in the bay um, outside the window. They've just got back here. But, and they're, they're, they're remarkable birds, but they're big birds too. Whereas a hummingbird, um, a rufous hummingbird in particular, is a tiny thing. And so for a bird like that to migrate 3,000 miles, I find that awe inspiring. And as you can see, Alaska. Um, while it's got more trees than here in Shetland, in some regards, it's not that different. It's, it's a pretty tough place for a hummingbird to, uh, to, to eke a living. It's not like the Neotropics where there's abundant nectar. Um, it's somewhere where only in the summer are there are any flowers to, to, to feed from. Um, now, what I'd love to show you is a photo of a rufous hummingbird that I found that unfortunately I don't have one. I saw one fleeting female bird while I was there. And so, what I'm showing you here is, is one of my other passions, which are some orchids, which I found there. Um, I could have shown you, that's, you have to count yourselves lucky, I could have shown you a vast pile of steaming bear scat, because that was the other big event of my visit to Alaska, was getting a, a close encounter with a bear, which, which um, you know, was, was, was slightly unexpected. We don't have things like that here in the UK. The journey would end down in Tierra del Fuego on the shores of the Beagle Channel. And this was the place where Charles Darwin saw um, his first hummingbirds when he came on HMS Beagle to the Americas. And there um, I, I, I was looking for a particular species which is, is, is found essentially in the sub-Antarctic region, which is, is green-backed fire crown. And, and I do happily have, have a picture, picture of that to share with you. Um, now, this quest was taking several forms. It wasn't just 
seeing the birds in their full geographic range, although it was certainly that. But I wanted to, to see three things, really. I wanted to see the, the, the most extreme and remarkable hummingbirds in, in one sense, the, in terms of, of, of their physical manifestations, their size, for example, in Cuba, the smallest bird in the world, the, the bee hummingbird, which is a mind-bogglingly small bird, even by any hummingbird standards. Um, I also wanted to see those with the most sumptuous plumage, and we, we've, we've touched on that. It was the colour which really drew me to, to hummingbirds in the first instance. Um, velvet purple coronet is, is, is arguably the, the, the most extravagantly rich and sumptuous of all. And I wanted to, 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 to see these, 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 these birds which were the, the very epitome of, of, of hummingbird beauty. And also, I wanted to see those with the most remarkable form. Um, and here um, is, is what for many birders um, in the near tropics is, is this kind of the holy grail of, of, of hummingbirds, the marvelous spatula tail. Um, this was a bird which I'd seen on David Attenborough documentaries as, as, a, as a boy um, displaying, and, and they're incredible birds when they display, they, they curl their, their tail feathers up in a lyre shape around them um, and they, they, they perform in, a, in a, an amphitheater of, of lichen smothered branches to, to, to the females. Um, amazing birds and I wanted to, to see them see them all. Um, and what I'd like to do at this, this juncture is, is, is perhaps share a couple of, of specific um, encounters with hummingbirds, which, which, which appear in the book. Now, dusky star from doesn't really fit into any of those three categories of sumptuous plumage, extremes of body size or form. Um, and actually this was, this was kind of a, a replacement bird. It was the last minute substitution. It's found in Colombia um, and it's one of the lost hummingbirds. And there's another hummingbird, which is a lost hummingbird, and I'll ex kind of explain what that means in a second, which was what I wanted to see, and that was blue-bearded helmet crest. That was found in 1880 in Santa Marta uh, mountain range in the very north of, of Colombia. And it was known and, and collected, unfortunately, right the way through to the early, um, or sort of the 1940s. And at that point, it just wasn't heard of again, and it just went missing for 70 odd years until um, in, uh, in, in the late, um, sorry, no, not in the late 90s, in the early 21st century, it was rediscovered by a couple of young Colombian birders. And it's, it's found in such a remote place, there's no vehicle access, you, you have to trek in, it takes about a week to go and see it on foot or horseback. And this was a bird which captured the, the, my heart. It was beautiful. It was rem, had rem, a romance to its story. And I really wanted to see one because probably about 50 bird watchers in the world had seen one at, at, the, at the juncture I was heading to Colombia. So it had everything. And I had arranged with uh, a friend in Colombia, um, one of the best known birders in Colombia, a wonderful guy called Diego Calderon to an exhibition to go and see the blue-bearded helmet crest. And we'd organized, or rather he had organized everything for me, the horses, the, the, the porters, the, the whole thing. And then two days before I was due to head out to Colombia, um, disaster struck. I'd not heard from Diego for a couple of days. And, well, I'm sorry, a couple of weeks, in fact. And, I wasn't unduly worried. I knew he'd been in Uganda bird watching, and I guess he was traveling back, but still two days before he traveled, you kind of want a little reassurance. And I got an email from him to say that he'd actually been hospitalized over the Christmas period. He'd, um, as he put it, he'd almost, see, he'd seen the light. He had come close to death. He'd been absolutely incapacitated with a, a really bad attack of malaria. And the bottom line of, of, of his email was, John, I can't take you to see the blue-bearded helmet crest. It's just, my doctor has said I can't do it. 
and you know I can't I can't help you. Now all my plans were laid, but of course, what am I going to do? I needed to see some exciting hummingbird, and then I realised, of course, there was another lost hummingbird in Colombia, the dusky star frontlet. This was a bird which, by the time the blue bearded helmet crest had fallen off of bird watchers' radars, this hadn't even been discovered. But in the 1950s, um, it was found in in the central uh, um, cordillera of the of, of the Andes. And it existed and was known as just one specimen in the museum right the way through until um, 2004, at which point it was rediscovered. So it, had, it was another lost hummingbird. It had dropped off the radar. And I thought I could see this under my own steam. I, I spoke to a, 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 a lodge in, in Colombia, which said they, they had um, dusky star frontlets at their feeders. And I thought, yeah, I can do that on my own. I, I, I can be brave. I, I don't need porters and horses and guides. I can just do this. So I went to that particular uh, lodge and discovered that, in fact, the last uh, dusky star frontlets had been seen there three months ago and I was in the wrong place. And then two really kind uh, young Colombian birders um, took pity on me. And what ensued was a nine hour drive in a four by four with brake failure through the Andes to a different site. In fact, the site where the very first dusky star front that was, collect was collected back in the 1950s. We drove, as I say, in a car with no brakes, which was terrifying. Um, and after night fell, we, we came across landslides which had swept away roads. It was, it was a hair-raising <laughs> journey um, to a town in, in Colombia called Rao. And from there, I was able to hike up into the mountains and then get on a horse and go still further up. And I saw my, my first dusky star front eventually after, after all of that. And... I have to say, because it was such a, a, a um, such a, a yearned for and difficult, hard won hummingbird, it it kind of meant more to me than almost any hummingbird I saw. And there's a little passage from the book I'd, I'd love to share with you, which gives you a taste for what this bird was like and and, and what it meant to me. Innately. I knew what I would see if only I could find a window in the leaves without disturbing the bird within. This, surely, was my dusky star frontlet. I moved painstakingly slowly around the clearing, changing the angles until, at last, I could see a dark bird perched low above the ground. I raised my binoculars to my eyes, and there it was. Black as tar, a long, th straight, thin bill and a glittering obsidian eye that stared watchfully back at me. He cocked his head slightly and his throat lit up cobalt blue, while his forecrown blazed golden green. A small shift on his perch, and the whole bird was alight, his breast and belly made up of many dozens of iridescent, coruscating scales of lime green. He looked otherworldly, like some enameled hummingbird god of fallen to earth. I hardly dared breathe. I lost track of time. He probably sat there for only a minute or two, but those minutes became elastic and the moment felt infinite. When he flew, time snapped back into the now and I was released. This bird was so loaded with romance, longing and history, seeing it was quite unlike watching any hummingbird that had gone before for me. So that was the dusky star from Gillette. Um, there was another hummingbird which, which stood out during, during my, my journey. And this was the Juan Fernandez fire crown, which is found in the uh, Juan Fernandez archipelago, which is some 450, 500 miles off the coast of Chile, out into the Pacific Ocean. Um, the island it's found on is known now as Isla Robinson Crusoe. And that's not a, a, a glib name. This is because in the, uh, let's get this correct here, the 18th century, um, 
Scottish sailor Alexander Selkirk was cast away on the island and spent some four years there living on his own, hiding from the occasional Spanish ships which came into dock there. Um, and he was the inspiration, um, he was rescued. He was the inspiration for um, Daniel Defoe's um, eponymous Robinson Crusoe. And on that island is found a hummingbird, which is found on that island and nowhere else in the world. Um, for many years, until the 1980s, in fact, it was actually believed there were two unique species on the island. So dimorphic were the, the male and the female, so unlike one another. And that, that's normal for hummingbirds. The males and the females all, you know, usually look different. However, the bird on the right there, the, the female, um, the bird with the white breast spangled with uh, ultramarine spots, is really brightly coloured for, for a female hummingbird. Normally they're very drab, um, greys and greens and whites. And so for years they were believed to be two different species until ornithologists realised that in fact they were just the one species. Um, they're known to be a, 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 a threatened bird. There's, they're only found on one small island and on that island only in one corner of it. Um, Bird life estimate there are a thousand individuals left. Um, when I got onto the island and spoke to the small team of, um, of uh, conservation uh, workers who are tasked with trying to maintain and, and, and conserve and improve what fragments of habitat are left, they actually said, a thousand? No, we count the nests every year. That's what we're here for. It's just 400 of these birds left. Um, and what they're facing is, is, is a good metaphor for, for what a lot of hummingbirds and indeed other birds and other biodiversity are facing all across the Americas. Um, but on Gila Robinson Crusoe, it's a perfect storm. Um, they, <laughs> where do we begin? There are rats, both black rats and brown rats. There are mice all of which, of course, were introduced from the, the sailing vessels which came through the, the 16th, 17th um, centuries to the island. Um, and they, of course, predate birds. Uh, there are cats, which were also introduced at the time um, and are still seen as an essential part of every house on the island because, of course, they've got a rodent problem. But they also live feral in the, in, in the wild across the island. Um, in the early part of the 20th century, God knows why, um, it's said because um, the island was becoming a national park and someone thought it would make it more interesting. Someone introduced Kawatimundi, which is the really tooled up, frightening looking mammal in the bottom left of the screen. They're omnivorous. They, they are, are not a good thing to have in a, in a, in a, in a, 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 a non-native context. Um, there are also, of course, once um, people settled on the island, they, they bought all of the usual things which people bring. They bought goats, they bought sheep, um, they bought cows and rabbits. So there are tons of non-native herbivores which are grazing the um, natural um, understory of the island. Um, people also introduced eucalyptus as well. So a lot of the native timber has been replaced by non-native um, trees which is a nice way of saying that the habitat not only is, is beset with predators which, which, which have suppressed and, and, and driven a decline in the hummingbirds, but also the habitat which is suitable for them is vastly diminished, which leads us to one last thing. Someone else on the island thought it would be a good idea to introduce some um, bramble bushes, blackberries, as a stock-proof fence to put around their garden to keep all of those herbivores out and to give them a, 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 a nice fruiting um, shrub to, to, to pick some blackberries from. And those things are spreading like wildfire across the island and suppressing um, the natural um, endemic um, understory. So these poor birds are really up against it. And this was a chastening moment for me because I'd seen some hummingbirds which conservation was helping to address their population decline in a localized context. But when I spoke to the guys on the island who were working with the conservation um, of the Juan Fernandez Firecrown, they said, ah, 
will probably be extinct in 20, 30 years. And what's needed, of course, is massive investment and effort, which probably isn't going to happen. And this was a terrible moment for me to stare a hummingbird in the eye and realize that it would probably be extinct within my lifetime. As I say, it's a metaphor for a lot of what's happening out of sight and out of mind from our day-to-day -day lives um, throughout the, the wilder parts of, of the world as a whole. Um, so to go back to my original question of why hummingbirds, um, the answer it, I found was because they touch something within us and they, they, they also, whilst the, you know, we've seen some terrible examples of, of how we are impacting upon them, they also bring out the best in us. Um, the guy there you can see who's holding a hummingbird up to a, to a feeder on a twig um, was a wonderful man I met in Brazil, um, Senor Juanes de Bronzo, who has devoted his retirement to um, caring for hummingbirds in his garden in a remote part of the uh, Atlantic forest on the uh, Brazilian coast. Um, and when I visited him and, and saw um, many rare species which occur in his garden in a free-flying state, I found he was caring for an injured hummingbird. Her wing was broken, and with a hummingbird, you know, that's, that's almost irreparable and normally a fatal accident. Um, he was feeding her every 15 minutes from a special feeder, which he'd added uh, protein powder to the water to ensure that she... She got the uh, protein which she would normally get from foraging insects in addition to nectar. And the care that he, he was, he was lavishing on that one bird spoke to me. And the, the syringe you see hanging there um, on the, in the other image was something I found in Cuba where um, people um, who had hummingbirds visiting their garden they may not be able to afford a hummingbird feeder, but they were, they were improvising. The hummingbirds mattered to them, and they were using old medical equipment to create homemade um, hummingbird feeders. And this was something which I, I found time and again. Hummingbirds touch something deep within us. Um, correspondents all through the United States told me about examples of where Hummingbirds made a, a huge difference to um, themselves or an elderly relative. There is something uniquely um, powerful and, and resonant about hummingbirds. And I'd like to leave you with, with uh, perhaps my favorite of all of the hummingbirds, and that's the marvelous spatula tail. Um, this was a bird which uh, I saw in Peru and this was the point at which I discovered that uh, a hummingbird could be literally as well as figuratively jaw-dropping. When I saw my first marvelous spatula tail, I found myself with my mouth hanging open. Just the most incredible bird um, and uh, a totemic species for me. And I hope that um, You've enjoyed my little dive into the into the world of the hummingbirds. Um, the glitter in the green um, is a is a much deeper dive into their world, and um, I hope you enjoy it. And uh, I'd like to thank um, thank you for for coming along today to to hear me speak. Thank you, John. That's fascinating, and we'll take some questions from the audience. We can type them in the Q and A. Okay, um, we have a question. Could you tell us a little bit about your wildlife tour guiding and where you do it? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, currently, obviously, um, in the, the, the present terrible circumstances, it's all on hold. Um, I live in the, the Shetland Islands. I, I moved here specifically because it is such a, a, a wonderful place for natural history. So, um, we get a lot of people coming here to see the incredible seabirds and cetaceans, the whales and dolphins. Um, and so I get to do a lot of stuff on my own doorstep, but I also lead tours right the way through Europe, um, in Eastern Europe, Southern Europe. Um, hummingbirds are just 
one string to my bow I'm crazy mad about, as I said earlier, butterflies, birds and orchids. So I lead tours um, right the way through the Mediterranean out to, to, to roads in, the, in the, the far east of the Aegean, um, all the way through France and Spain, um, um, stuff in Italy, but also in the, the northeast of, of Europe, so in Estonia, Hungary. Um, if there's some wonderful wildlife, I want to go and see it. Um, this autumn, God willing, and things hopefully returning to normal, I'll be heading to Bhutan for the first time. So. I'll be spreading my wings into, into the Himalayas. <laughs> it's exciting times. Um, all right, now we have another question from Mary. What's the best way to feed them and what flowers should we plant? That's a good question. Um, as I said, I don't have hummingbirds here in the UK. However, um, I think Audubon are probably the, the best resource to go to, to to get specific examples of plants. I do know that they love um, columbines, um, so the uh, aquilegias, I think that is the, the, correct, um, the correct family for, for the columbines. They, they love um, salvias. Um, if, you, if, you, if you can get something like porter weed to grow in your garden, that's a, a shrub which, which does really well in um, Central America and is very nectar rich. But as I say, don't take it from me. Have a look at Audubon. I am sure a quick Google will give you far better horticultural advice than I can. Uh, we have another question. Let me just pull it up here. Um, what, uh, wait a sec, they put it in chat. <laughs> well, before, while I wait for that, um, did Audubon paint hummingbirds? Um, yes, Audubon did, did paint a, a, a few hummingbirds. Um, he wrote really um, lovingly about um, about the ruby-throated hummingbirds, um, but also um, the uh, mangoes as well. So yeah, there are some Audubon um, images of, of hummingbirds, and pretty much everything was grist to his mill. And in fact, um, he painted, I think I'm right in saying, um, I think it was Anna's hummingbird, and this just shows what a crazy world it was at the time. He didn't paint that from life. He painted that from a specimen which was sent to him by a English Victorian hummingbird collector, a guy called George Lodiges, who actually is the guy after whom the marvelous spatula tail I left you with was named. That's um, it's a genus all of its own called Lodigesia, named after him. Um, so yeah, Audubon um, painted his hummingbird, his, I think it was Anna's hummingbirds from, from specimens sent back from Britain to the Americas where they were originally collected um, by Lodiges. Okay, we have another question. How are you able to photograph them? They're usually too quick for me. Well, um, full admission, um, for every photo I've got, which I'm happy with, there are, several hundred I've chucked in the digital dustbin. Um, I, I, I do have, you know, I'm, I'm a wildlife photographer, so I do, I do have a, a, a kind of a high-end Canon camera with a big lens. What I don't do, and a lot of uh, some hummingbird photographers use multiple flashes to freeze them in the moment. And that's not something I'm terribly keen on. It seems very unnatural. Um, and as anyone who reads the book will, will discover with, without too much of a spoiler here, um, in Ecuador, I encountered hummingbird photographers who really weren't putting the bird's welfare first. They were um, removing the feeders, which the birds in a particular area were, had become dependent upon to um, create an artificial um, environment where there was just one flower um, and they had all the flashes set up around it. And that sort of thing, I, I, I'm not keen on. I, I, for me, animals' welfare or wildlife's welfare has to come first. And so my pictures are taken in natural light. Um, and some of them are taken on, on, on an iPhone. Um, if, they can, if they're coming to a feeder, you can get some really lovely pictures on just a normal phone. But um, yeah, a, a, a bridge camera or a, a, a DSLR helps a lot. Sounds good. Here we have a question from, uh, let's see, from Gail. 
uh, what are you working on next? Gosh, that's a secret because I've not got a book deal yet for it. <laughs> um, I, I, I know I, 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 I do have something I'm excited about. Um, my last book was kind of like the hummingbirds. I, I took one particular thing. I took orchids and wrote all about the orchids of Britain and Ireland, but their fabulous rich cultural history and, and the people involved with them, past and present and so on. And the hummingbirds was doing that on a grander stage. The next book will be different. It's not taking one particular um, family of, of, of organism. It's, it's uh, something different, but to do with natural history um, and also to do with human obsession, because I find that really interesting as a writer, how mm. things grab people and make them do some really crazy stuff. And so, yeah, I've, I've, I've got a good idea. I'm excited about it. I can't tell you any more than that. I'm so sorry. It sounds good. Uh, a question, is there a similar element in hummingbirds, iridescence, and lightning bugs? And, and lightning bugs was that? Yes. Not really. Um, the, the hummingbirds, uh, and I, this is one of the, I found lots of, I discovered lots of things I didn't know about hummingbirds in the course of researching the book. And yeah, I knew they were sparkly and iridescent and so on, but how they do that, how they achieve that iridescence, is is quite unique. Um, I'm going grey here, but the darkness in 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 one's hair is, or the colour in one's hair is, is um, a, a product of of melanin, and that's the same with all mammals and birds as well. Melanin is is what gives the the, the pigment in their fur or the feathers. But hummingbirds have a, a unique structure within their uh, in the, within their feathers. Um, which which allows that um, they have a kind of pancake shaped um, cells within their feathers, which are filled with tiny air bubbles, and this allows the the colour to to appear to us to our vision or to other hummingbirds, of course, critically because they're not doing it for us; they're doing it to attract a mate or see off a rival, um, to appear so incredibly bright and um, striking. So um, insects are, are, are working in a very different way. It's so, and I, I, I'm, I'm not a scientist, so I can't tell you how, but I know it's different. Okay. Um, the one question, how long did your exploration take? Did you split it up? Yeah, I did. Um, I, the, the book is presented as a narrative arc, which goes from Alaska to Tierra del Fuego as if it was one contiguous journey. Um, I couldn't have been away from home that long. So it's a, it's, it is a, 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 a naughty writer's device. I actually took how many years? About 10 years to, to do this. It was always in the back of my mind that one day I'd love to write a book about hummingbirds. So I was, I was, I was doing trips to see hummingbirds in various places, partly just for my own joy and benefit because I just love them so much but also with the book in the back of my mind and so yeah I I I, I split the 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 the, 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 the whole thing over a period of years it did intensify in the past couple of years because I knew the book was a thing at that point and uh, my poor partner would would testify to just how long I was away from home for and <laughs> She, she 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 only found out that the half of it when I'd written the manuscript and she she read the chapter about um Bolivia and said what you were threatened by men with machetes at a, at a roadblock you didn't tell me that well no you know you don't want to worry people but yeah there was it was it I I landed in some places at just the wrong point in time and Bolivia was was one of them wow I have another question uh, from Gail, which she says is off point, but have you ever seen them filming PBS's Shetland's TV series? Question mark. Oh God. How off, how, how, how off, off, oh, I don't know, it's <laughs> inappropriate now. Um, yes, all the time. Uh, <laughs> 
the film crew have, have even rented the house at one point, the, the old Croft house. Um, the author of Shetland, um, Anne Cleves, um, is a friend of mine, and um, her late husband, Tim Cleves, was, um, it was a birder. So that's how Anne and I came to meet. And uh, yeah, I, uh, I can't say anything more without saying anything really inappropriate, but so someone I used to be close to appears in one of the books, I think is all I'll say in, in it. Not in cameo, just a, a character which is very familiar. Alrighty, I think we're getting close to the end. Um, let's see, one more question. Why are hummingbirds so antagonistic to each other? Yeah, this is this is something which um, surprises people sometimes you know you, you we, we we sort of hear of hummingbirds as these wonderful gentle sprites which are you know feeding on nectar and it it, it all sat they're portrayed as as these sort of benign innocents but as 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 the as the as the uh person who asked posed the question is clearly aware they're actually really pugnacious and they 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 will square up to one another at a heartbeat um and it all boils down to well, two things. Um, partly, their fast metabolisms. Um, you know, a hummingbird needs to to consume um, a lot of nectar to to keep running, um, and so a nectar source is something which they um, defend, um, to, you know, to, to with with vehemence because it's a matter of life and death to have a source of food. And so, yes, hummingbirds will will square up to one another at a feeder, which is often where we see them, um, simply because they're trying to defend that. And the other thing is sex. They are like, you know, all all um, mammals and birds. They are um, all about attracting a mate and keeping a mate and reproducing um, their genes, sending their genes on to another generation. And so you'll often see um, males being particularly male hummingbirds being particularly um, antagonized by the appearance of another male hummingbird because that's a threat. That's that means that they're not going to pass their necessarily their their uh, genes on to to uh, a receptive female bird. So it's two things. It's it's food and sex. OK, and I think one last question. You have chosen to live where there are no hummingbirds. What wildlife uh, do you enjoy in Shetland? Well, I, I wish there were hummingbirds here, but I am spoiled for choice. Um, the seabirds, Shetland is home to some of the most fabulous seabird colonies in the whole of Europe. So I, I'm looking over the screen, even as I speak to you, and there are gannets plunge diving into the bay. They're the first Arctic terns are back. The, there will be puffins behind me on the cliffs oh, wow. starting to go into their nest burrows. But the, the really big thing as a birder is, is migration. Um, spring migration is pretty good here. Um, autumn or fall is absolutely epic here in Shetland. There is nowhere better in Europe to witness fall migration. And we get vagrant birds blown here from um, Siberia in the east, from the Americas in the West. Um, I've seen a veery here on the little island that I live on um, and various warblers as well. We started talking about how dull the warblers in Europe are, but I've seen Cape May warbler here, Tennessee warbler, black pole warbler. And so these things actually turn up here as well. And that's incredibly exciting. It's like playing the lottery every time you step outside the, the front door at that time of year, you never know what you're going to, to find. And that's thrilling, but also, and I mean, this is this is daft, but I, I love this stuff. I have harbour porpoises living in the bay outside the house. So on a calm day, I see them, but you get stuff like killer whales, humpback whales, minky whales, and lots of different sorts of dolphin as well. So I'm living in one of the great wild places in Europe and you know, I couldn't be happier. Um, but yeah, sounds, I mean, birds. Sounds enchanting. Well, I'd like to thank you so much for making our morning so colorful and wonderful. We will record this session for people who had to leave or for people who didn't have a chance to see it. And please stop by Barrack Books and pick up this beautiful book because you won't be sorry. So John, thank you so much for starting our day off in such a lovely manner.
Well, thank you everyone for, for, for coming and joining me and um, thanks for inviting me. And oh, I do sure. enjoy the book. All right. So have a great day. Thanks, Bye -bye, everyone. everyone. <laughs>